sound yes please be seated good morning this to our service this morning at IBC for those new people who might not know me I'm Franz Manches I'm one of the elders at IBC and I want to just greet you and, and say welcome to us this morning also for this outside service we know it's a little bit wet this morning and we expect a little bit of rain later on so don't feel intimidated if you need to move a little bit uh, to be better protected under you know feel free to do that um, you know we, we understand we're not gonna uh, you know, <laughs> we want you to, to also be able to, in, to participate in the service. I want to start this morning by telling you a short story from, my, from the town where I grew up. I grew up in a very, very um, remote rural area in South Africa. 
and uh, and it's a it's a desert, a semi-desert area. And uh, the people had a saying there that um, if it starts to rain, you should never take out your umbrella, because you chase away the rain. So uh, I see a lot of umbrellas here this morning. Now I'm not superstitious, and I'm not advocating that the umbrellas will chase it, because I'm actually believing in a in, in a God of providence. So we also prayed and we trust that the Lord will also help with the weather this morning. Now, while I was thinking about beliefs, I wanted this morning to start by reading the Apostles' Creed with you. And I have not given it out to you, so you, you will not have it in your hands. But I'm going to ask you shortly to stand and then just join in with me. And, and the reason for it is I want us to declare this morning before we start, what do we believe as Christians? And you're going to hear a few things in the Apostles' Creed. You're firstly going to hear something about God. You're going to hear something about Jesus and His life on earth. You're going to hear something about the Holy Spirit. And you're also going to hear something about the church. And there's one word that sometimes is confusing when we talk about the church. is when we use the word a holy Catholic church. And it's important for us just to understand what does that word mean. And the definition for that is that that is the true Christian church of all times and all places. So we're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church when we say Catholic. We're talking about all Christians of all times um, when we declare that in the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed was really one of the first, first uh, creeds that the Christians used to declare what we are believing. So you're welcome to stand with me and then we will immediately go into the singing of the songs um, after that, and I will just read it to you, and I'm not sure if the version I have will be one that you will remember. So, the Apostles' Creed. I believe, oh, if you want to, uh, you know, speak aloud with me, if you remember, you're welcome to do that. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His Holy Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
I fear my fate will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never care. Please be seated. And okay, I'm handing to Martina. Hey, I guess adults are hearing me very well. But children, are you hearing me? Children, and I mean all children, not just BBS children, but all children who are sitting here today right now come and join me i want to show you something i think it's interesting and exciting please come and take a seat it's extra for you here come get near me then it's much more cozy come forward all children Very good to see you come. Yeah, get all cozy and close if necessary. This is for you. Because I have a few things I want to show you. And I have a few things I want you to listen to. 
Here is a treasure box. Actually, it's a vacation Bible school preschool treasure box. I was very happy they made it. Can children, do you like treasure? Now that's a big word. What is a treasure? Any ideas? Does, can anyone give me an example of treasure? Gold. Gold, definitely on the dot, yes. Diamonds, silver, jewels, sunken treasure maybe in the sea. Yes. During VBS, we thought about what really are true treasures. And do you know, one treasure in my life and many others' lives is VBS as VBS. Because it's a treasure box full of fun and also full of information. We learn so many things. And I have here just one tiny little example from the treasure box of Vacation Bible School. Let's see if you recognize this little fellow. Pogo is his name. But what is Pogo? A poison dart frog. Children, believe me, when I read that for the first time, I nearly fainted. Vacation Bible school buddy, a poison dart frog. But something is very interesting and good to know. They are very beautiful, right? They come in many fantastic colors. And they are teeny weeny tiny, like a walnut. But they can be poisonous on the skin. And in your Bible Buddy video, we learned something. It was tucked away, so probably not many picked up on it. But I thought, wow. It's a little bit like sin in our life. It can be very small. It can be looking very beautiful and tempting. Ah, I should have this. Maybe I can steal it, just take it without asking. So sin can look beautiful, and it starts usually very tiny. But it will be poisonous if we really touch the sin. Like if we touch a poison dart frog. But there is interesting good news. A poison dart frog is poisonous only because of the food he eats. If you have a poison dart frog in the zoo or at home as your pet and you feed him the right stuff, they no longer are poisonous. So it's important what we feed. It's important what we put in our stomach for our health. But equally important is what do we feed our minds with? What do we put in our head? What do we put into our thoughts? What do we feed our hearts with? And now, let us hear from someone. This is an extra little surprise treasure, and it's such a big treasure, it doesn't fit into this treasure box. So, in preparation for that, a special guest who of you knows what an interview is? Yes? Someone usually famous and you ask questions. That's an interview. And now I have a treasure-like interview for you. Ladies and gentlemen, Boys and girls, I have the great pleasure to welcome from the BBC Biblical Broadcasting Company <laughs> our special royal correspondent, Elaine Kirton. Let's call her out with a big applause. Thank you very much, Martina. Dear children, are you ready to welcome a royal visitor for an exclusive interview. Please stand up because she is Can royal. Please stand up 
and give a royal applause for our royal guest, Queen Esther of Persia. Your Majesty, we are honored to have you as our special guest. Many girls were envious when you were chosen to be the new queen. We can see that you are indeed beautiful, that you wear beautiful clothes and beautiful jewels, mm. and that you live in a most beautiful palace. But is that all we should know about you? Certainly not. Actually, it was rather scary being in a palace suddenly t and wear the royal crown and at first I had to keep a secret that I'm a Jew and I believe in the one living God. Did you have any friends in the palace? There came a time when I worried about that. You see, an evil man named Haman, the king's advisor, told the king to make a rule that all people should bow down to Haman whenever they saw him. But such an honor only belongs to God. We Jews all know that. I felt a crisis coming on. And who helped you? Were you alone? Never, because I trusted in God. He showed me his care by putting helpful people near me. For example, my cousin Mordecai, because Mordecai gave me good advice, and also my maids and servant girls, because they fasted and prayed for me together. You needed to fast and pray? Yes, an evil man named Haman convinced the king to give a special order, a uh, command, that everyone who does not bow down should be killed. Well, that basically meant us Jews, us believers in God. I am the queen, so I thought I was safe. But Mordecai warned me, I, that that was not the case. And he told me that the only one, I was the only one who could change the king's mind, uh, my husband, and rescue the Jews. So you urgently needed to talk to the king. But as royal correspondent, I am aware of the protocol. And I know that as a queen, you also need an invitation to s talk to the king, your husband. Without an invitation, well, you risk the run the the risk of death. Yes, and I had to. N I had no invitation, but Mordecai had a serious talk with me. Why was I queen? The king may have chosen me for my beautiful face, but God chose because of an important and courageous thing. Mm. You actually had to accept that you might be killed if your husband, the king, would not welcome you by holding out his long scepter? Yes, I trusted in God with my life. I was even willing to die. Time was precious, but I did not rush into action. Just like that, I needed God's uh, reassurance and peace. So I fasted and prayed for three days together with my maids and what an encouragement. Also with all the other Jews in Persia, what an encouragement. And after those three days, how did you feel? I was still aware that the possibility of being killed, but God had given me strength to go to the king without an invitation, and God moved the heart of the king. He extended his long scepter to me and I could talk to him about the evil plan of Haman. All the Jews were safe after that. As my cousin Mordecai said, God chose me to be queen, but for a special time, because God had a special job for me to do. Thank you so much, Your Majesty, for granting us this exclusive interview. Dear children, please rise and say goodbye to Queen Esther with a big applause. And now you may sit down 
And now it is actually time for, for me to go and do some more interviewing. So goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Elaine. Thank you. What a queen. Was that a woman who was feeding on her beauty, just saying, oh, I'm so beautiful and that's all that I need? Did she feed on her beauty? No. She was feeding on her faith in God. And was Queen Esther totally alone? No. Who was with her to encourage her? Jesus uh, in the form of God. Yes, Jesus and God are the same. And God likes to place people in our lives to help us, to encourage us. Who were the people Queen Esther had as a little treasure from God to encourage her? Well, who remembers her cousin's name? Mordecai, for example, he was very important and had serious talks with her. And there was a group often overlooked. They fasted and prayed with the queen, the Jews, and her maids. I love that little detail. That was a big encouragement. And it gave her the peace to go to the king and was that a courageous thing to do for Queen Esther? Yes. yes, because when she made the decision, trusting God, whatever God decided, she was willing to accept what was one possible possibility. What could happen to her? Death. That is courage. And she prepared that by praying. She didn't rush into it. That's very important to remember. And she said her husband maybe looked mostly at her face. He wanted a beautiful queen. But what did God look at in Queen Esther? At her face or at her heart, at her willingness to trust him? And that's why God could choose her for a very special, very courageous task. And this all shows us Esther was treasured by God. So I'm back to treasure boxes. A treasure. If you get a gi big gift of gold, for example, for your birthday, is that already a treasure or just a big gift? Big gift. It's first of all a big gift because when I hear treasure, I think of treasure hunt you know, looking, searching, following clues. That is the fun of searching for treasure. And now I have one little item more in this treasure box. And who can have a look and tell the others what you see in this treasure box? Uh, is that gold? No. Is that silver there at the bottom? That's it's not jewels. It's nothing like that. But, dear children, this box is full of treasures. I'm holding lots of treasures right now in my hand because each paper had a name of a helper or child attending VBS. And I use these papers to form the crews and the assignments on a big table. I had you in my hand like a little treasure. But I know very, very little about each one of you or your mother or father or your older sibling who was helping at VBS. But there is one who knows all about you whom you can fully trust. And that one came and went on to a treasure hunt in a way, looking and searching for those he wanted to make his personal treasure. Who knows 
whom I mention now, whom I mean now. Who is the one who came to look and search so that he can gather treasured... I heard the name already. Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God and he came to earth to look for the people who needed help. And that's basically all of us, 100%. And he treasures it. He did a lot to reach us, to help us. It was Jesus who came and searched and who has made every one of you his treasure if you allow him to take you and guide you if you trust him. And the good news is also you're never jobless. He always will have a task for you, just like for Queen Esther. Just wait, trust, and be all excited what the next task might be. So let us close off. And VBS children, I think you know what to say in a moment because the treasure we can know is that God knows you. The treasure is that God hears you. The treasure is that God comforts you. you are the big treasure is that God forgives you. you are and the exciting treasure is that God chooses you. Thank you, dear children. Just let us close with a brief prayer. Then you go back to join your parents and you can work on the little activity sheets you were given at the reception desk. So just a moment, close your eyes, put your hands together. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you sent the fantastic treasure who is Jesus. He came and searched for us to rescue us from sin. Thank you that you have made us a treasure and that you have many exciting things for us to do. Help us to wait for you and to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. So while the children are returning today, their parents. I'm going to lead us in a moment in a congregation of prayer. And this is really the time we, we as a congregation pray together. And uh, we have many items also on our prayer list. And I will not pray for each one individually, but um, you can also take that home and pray for those needs um, on your own. Let's, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can be in this outside space to have church. We don't want to take this for granted. We've missed it for so long, and we're thankful that we can enjoy this. Thank you for the, the smiles, the conversation we can have also as a church, and that we can reconnect with each other. We are so grateful for that, and we, we pray that this will also have a meaningful for all of us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that is in our midst. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will open our hearts and our minds also to the preaching of your word that we will hear soon, and we pray that we will also on this journey that we are with David, that we would discover more truth and more valuable lessons from his life that we can also use in our own. Father, we are looking at this world and we see world events that's changing dramatically and, and sometimes very fast, um, things that we didn't expect to go the way they did. And, and we particularly want to pray this morning for Afghanistan. We also want to pray for those people that's connected to this church who has direct influence and, and who has directly involved in that. We pray for them, for their protection, for wisdom, but above all, Father, that you would be with the people that's in the midst of this turmoil. And uh, we pray that they, that they would also be uh, a, a future outcome where the, the gospel can return to that nation and the gospel will change that nation because if we look at it from a human side, it looks like it's just going the wrong, the wrong direction. But thank you that we can trust you for also important things like that. Father, we pray for, for uh, persecuted brothers and sisters ac around the world. We think of them uh, in the different nations, and we think of Burkina Faso specifically from this morning. 
but we, we don't want to forget what's happening in the Middle East at the moment, that whole turmoil and, and all the things there. And we pray for every Christian there and every Christian that has decided to stay in those nations and not escape and go to another place. We pray a, a blessing on them. We pray protection on them. But above all, Father, we pray that they would take the message um, and, and bring it also to the people around them. Father, our church is restarting soon and, and there's many of the ministries that's getting ready for restarting. We pray for that. We pray for, for wisdom as we trying to understand the new rules and the relaxation of the rules and how that would impact us. But I pray that we as a church will again enjoy the, the different ministries that this church also have. And, and we pray a blessing on the leaders of these ministries and that you would um, guide them as they d uh, plan for the new year to come. We pray for our youth and our children we can never pray enough for the next generation, and we thank you that we can keep them in front of you. We also want to pray for our students in our midst, um, and as they're getting ready for the new year to start also, and for those who's writing still some exams before they restart, we pray uh, for them as well in particular. And then, Father, we, we thank you that you blessed our church in so many ways. We don't want to take it for granted. We, we have no right to that. It's just absolutely your grace and your mercy about um, on us and we take that um, and we thank you for that I pray that the rest of the service will give you all the glory and that you would be with us in this week and as we come back in, in a week's time let us not be the same change our lives and, and let us grow in our understanding of you and let us delve into your word we pray this in the name of Jesus Amen Well, the children have had their circulation time, and uh, the wind may be a bit chilly, but uh, I think you know the routine by now. Just stand up, circulate your blood, so that we can concentrate as well as the children did to their stories. Maybe say hello to someone whose eyes you don't recognize. Well, that's great. We can start taking our seats and uh, we're going to do a test run for coffee and tea after the service. I'll talk a little bit about that later. If you have your Bibles, you'd want to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 5. And uh, if you've been with us in our series, you know, we've done quite a, a leap here. Up to this point, we've been looking at uh, the rise of David. We've been looking at his years in the wilderness God certainly kept him fast in the wilderness. And now we're going to start to look at his reign. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, 1 Samuel ends uh, with the death of Saul and his son Jonathan. And even though Saul was the enemy of uh, David, we read about uh, how David lamented him. Uh, and then David is anointed as uh, king for the second time, but only over the tribe of Judah. It will be seven years, imagine that kind of patience, before he will reign over all 12 tribes. In fact, in 2 Samuel 2 verse 11, we're told that he was king in Hebron over Judah for seven years and six months. And then uh, in the early chapters of 2 Samuel, we uh, read how David becomes stronger and stronger against uh, his battles uh, with the Philistines. We read about the death of Abner, Saul's general who was still around. Uh, and then we read about the death of Ishbosheth, uh, who was uh, also one of Saul's children. And today we're going to look at chapter 5, where David eventually is crowned king over Israel. I'll read uh, chapter 5. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we're your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the old elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 
30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking, David can't come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. We read about how David built the city. And we read in verse 10 that David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees, also carpenters and masons, who built David a house. And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he'd exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. We then read about how David took more concubines and wives, not the best part of his history. We've seen how imperfect David was. We read about the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. And then we pick up in verse 17. And when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up. For I'll certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. We read later, verse 22, about how the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, This time, You shall not go up. Go around to their rear and come up against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Giza. Lord, uh, just as you kept Queen Esther fast, and just as you protected her so that she may reign over Israel and that Israel may survive so that one day Jesus, the King of Kings, might be born to reign over the whole world. So we thank you for the pictures that we see of Jesus in the life of David. You kept him fast, not because of who he was, but because of your grace and your mercy. And you have not changed. Help us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I know it's getting more and more difficult to buy a home these days if you are a younger couple. But some of you who are fortunate to own homes, you can remember the day, I think, when uh, you looked over this house and you uh, were about to sign and you saw that there were some things that needed doing. So maybe there was a wall that needed painting. Uh, there was uh, perhaps a gutter that needed replacing. Uh, there was a radiator that was not uh, working. So uh, even though you closed the deal, there were some things that need to be nailed down. And, you know, 2 Samuel chapter 5, it's, it's a little bit like this. Uh, we've got a kind of collage. I'll explain that in a moment, of how David nails down his kingdom. Uh, most of us might have a collage at home. I remember my mom, uh, when we were looking through her possessions after she went to be with the Lord, she had a collage of her children and grandchildren, and it wasn't in an order. You might have a photograph of a wedding, and then you might have the same son when he was three or four years old right by it. So there are a series of photos that are put together. And that's kind of how we look at, should look at these uh, events. For example, when Hiram, the king of Tyre, comes on the scene, this is not necessarily chronological order. 
it's uh, likely that this was at the end of David's reign because that's when their reigns coincided. Uh, but there are timeless principles for us as we serve the Lord where he has placed us. All of scripture is relevant for all of the ages. So there are lessons for you and me as we live in Brussels at this time. Just four lessons, I'll go through them as briefly as possible. When God builds his kingdom, it begins with what I call the apparent nothingness of God's city. Or if I can put it another way, God loves to work with what the world calls insignificant. And so we read in verses 1 to 7 of how uh, uh, David as chosen king needs a city. And so David and his men march to Jerusalem to attack and capture the city from the Jebusites. And we read in verse 7 that David captured the fortress of Zion, listen to this, which is the city of David. Now in those days it wasn't so easy to capture a city because of the very thick walls. So if you couldn't starve them out, you'd have to find another way. And it seems that David and his men used um, a kind of a water shaft. Uh, they had a water shaft that went uh, sort of almost underneath the city walls. And either David and his men climbed up the water shaft, or more likely uh, they got one or two men in and they were able to cut the rope. And therefore, eventually, the uh, city, the people could not drink, and they surrendered. And now Zion, which was in enemy territory, became David's city. Uh, Zion is a word that you read of often in Scripture. It's, uh, it's very rich. But I'm wanting you to see that when David eventually captures the fortress, Zion is just 11 acres of ground on a banana-shaped hill south of the future temple. And the point I simply want to draw, brothers and sisters, is that God can do incredible things out of the insignificant. In Isaiah 24, verse 23, after God speaks of judgment on the whole world, He says, The moon will be dismayed, the sun will be ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, with great glory. Uh, think of the insignificant in your life and think of what we consider to be insignificant. Some of you are parents and uh, you are praying for your children. They've heard the word of God and they've heard the seed and some have grown and you're wondering, Lord, what can you do with our feeble prayers? There was a great woman, a feeble woman called Susanna Wesley who herself was one of 25 children, and she would pray for every one of her 16 children. Her children knew when she pulled up her apron that they would not, should not disturb their mom because mom was praying for them. And out of Susanna Wesley's feeble praying, two of her sons became powerful preachers, and John Wesley was used of God to lead many people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't despise the insignificant in your life. Don't despise what God can do with that which is small. And then notice with me that when God builds his kingdom, there's an amazing certainty of God's promise. Uh, we've all met very cocky people, and that is people who are proud, and the, the Jebusites were very proud. Um, David, even our lame and blind could stop you for coming in here. They feel secure and smug behind their three meter walls kind of reminds me of uh of dunkirk and some of you saw the film which came out about uh, four years ago um, what you may not know is that in the evacuation uh, the british lost over 200 ships 177 planes they left behind the wreckage of 2,000 guns thousands of vehicles uh, and there was a story of one German major who was as cocky as the Jebusites. He looked over the beach and he said, the British are finished. And history tells us the opposite. And the Jebusites show us the beauty of God's promise. You know, the uh, Israelites had not always been faithful to God. When they marched into the promised land, they were told to dislodge the Jebusites who lived in the land, but they didn't. And I need to take you back to a promise to verse 18 of Genesis 15.
to show you how God fulfills his promises. When God said to Abraham in his covenant, the time will come when I will give this land, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, and so on, and the Jebusites to you. And I want you to see the connection. It's 800 years later. And God is saying, my promises have no expiry date. Sometimes it happens sooner. Sometimes it happens later. But God says, where are your enemies now? I want you to be careful, brothers and sisters. It's very easy to read the, uh, the Old Testament and say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a New Testament Christian. So what, is, what does all of this mean to me? The reason that you love Jesus today in this fallen world with all of the struggles, the reason that Afghani Christians, some of them are choosing to stay in Kabul, the reason that Christians continue to serve the Lord Jesus Christ is because of promises made not 800 years ago, but 2,000 years ago. If one of the promises that God or His Son Jesus made ever faltered, God would not be God. I'm very encouraged by that. You know, maybe you think of the church as having a limited impact in these days. And by the way, the church in Africa and in Asia is growing in amazing leaps and bounds. And maybe, maybe you're thinking, you know, what, what's our motivation to share the gospel? Uh, it's that we know that God's kingdom will not fail. <laughs> it's that we know the promise of Jesus that 2,000 years ago, the Son of God said, John 6:37. All that the Father gives to me shall come to me. I will break down the walls of unbelief. And anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. That's why we're part of the church. That's why we share the gospel. Thirdly, when God builds his kingdom, I want you to see the absolute priority of God's calling. Well, a city needs houses and a royal city needs a palace. And here you have King Hiram. All we know about him is that he's a pagan king but he sees something in David and the people of Israel that says to him God must be behind these people look how he is blessing them and maybe it's a kind of a, a prefigure of uh, Psalm 86 and verse 9 where we're told that all the nations you have made will come and worship before you Lord and bring glory to your name and at this point, I want to focus on David as this pagan king comes to him. And we're told that two things occupy his mind. And I didn't know that Martina was going to share the story about Queen Esther. But it was the same mindset that she had as she served her people and she served the Lord. David did not say when these things were brought to him, how great I am and how much I ought to be served. In verse 12, we read that then David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and he understands why. He knew that God had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. So David says, I have a position over Israel, but for Israel, for the people. It's one thing to know this, isn't it? And it's another thing to put this into action. I find it very easy to talk about being a servant. Using my hands and feet and my time and my energy, not for myself, but for the sake of others. Well, that can be a different matter. And I'm reminded, of course, of the greatest son of David. And this is why we call ourselves Christians, because we're called to follow in his steps. And he said, did he not, in Mark 10 and verse 45, if you really want to be first, you must be willing to be the slave of all. You must not just say it. There must be your very posture. There must be evident to those who are around you that you serve with capitals S-E-R-V-E. -E. You are a servant. I tell you, it brought amazing joy. I was round and about in this week going to the different bubbles. Oh, it was wonderful to hear the, the children laughing and learning. And I saw many people serving. And it wasn't just those who were up front. I saw the dad who looked after his baby. So 
His wife could serve in the audiovisual. I saw folk serving in the nursery, moms and grandmothers, so others could serve the children. I saw others making sure that there was water and coffee av available. And if you ask them, I, I, I think they would say, not glibly, but gladly, isn't that what Christians are supposed to do? May I ask you today, whether you're part of this church or not, are you a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? And may I quote John Wesley, whose mother prayed for him before he even knew it and who was converted. He said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, and do it for as long as you can. And in doing that, in serving, so you show that you belong to the Lord. And let me end with this today. When God builds his kingdom, you see what I call an, uh, just a beautiful, attractive versatility in his ways. I could have skipped over that, but it would be a pity. Most of us like the predictable, so um, you know what we're told here at the end of the chapter could unsettle us. Uh, and did you notice that when the, the Philistines come in force against David, he wisely inquires of the Lord what he should do. So, so the fact that the Lord is with him does not prevent him from seeking the Lord with all his heart as to, Lord, which way shall I go? And, and the first time we read in verse 19, the Lord answered him and said, Go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David goes, defeats them, and puts them to flight. But it's not the end of the story. Once more the Philistines gather. And once more David asks, and this time there's a different response. Don't go straight up, but circle around them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. And when you hear the wind rustling through the trees, move quickly, and then you will know that the Lord's gone ahead of you, and you can strike down the Philistines. Brothers and sisters, same, same situation, different approach. And that's one of the reasons why we worship God. Because if you're like me, you like to have God figured out in your mind. You know what you would like, how you would like Him to react. And, and while God is consistent in character, God will never be anything else but holy. He will never be anything else but just. So we can be sure that He will also be multicolored in the way He works. I want you to see that you cannot put God in a box. We're almost through, but I think you see that very clearly in the New Testament. And I'll just use one illustration that comes from the book of Acts. You meet a lady called Lydia in Philippi. And you ask her, Lydia, how did you become a Christian? How is it that you came to know the Lord? And she says to you, well, you know, I was at a prayer meeting in, by a river. And Paul spoke. And the Holy Spirit tugged at my heart. And the Lord opened my heart to believe. And then you take the microphone as we did there. And you do an interview now with the Philippian jailer in the same city. And we say, well, how is it that you came to believe in the living God? And he says, how could I not believe? As I heard Paul and Silas singing in their suffering, and then as if that wasn't loud enough, there was an earthquake. And that got my attention. How about this for an unusual conversion? 1533 in France. And some Christian pastors are meeting together in secret because they were not allowed to worship the Lord Jesus Christ as Protestants. And with them is a medical doctor, a man by the name of Dr. Poitier. And they say, well, you know, share, share your testimony. And he speaks of how monks and priests would come to him in his surgery to be cured of the diseases, he called it, that came with celibacy. You heard me right. Because they were ordered to live an unnatural life, where do you think they went to fulfill their sexual desires? We call them ladies of the night. They were prostitutes. Who would have thought 
Who would have thought that as this doctor treated these men, he said, something's not right here. And he began to open his scriptures and read. And in his case, it wasn't the godly lifestyle that drew him to the truth. It was the ungodly lifestyle of those who claimed to be living for the Lord. If we took the time here, which we can't, and isn't it wonderful that the rain seems to be disappearing and the clouds <laughs> are moving? If we took the time, brothers and sisters, it would be something to hear of all the conversions of each one of us right here who know the Lord. But however mysterious God's ways are, He is consistent in being versatile. The way He has worked in your life, believer, is not necessarily the same that He has worked in your spouse's life or He's working in your children's life. It's not the same in terms of your sanctification experience. You can say with the psalmist, how majestic, Lord, is your work in all the world. And how varied in our lives and in bringing people to faith and in making us like the Lord Jesus Christ. You love us and you treasure us and you're molding us and you're never dull and you're never boring. And therefore we worship you. And therefore we love you. So the takeaway collage I want you to take into this week. I want you to remember it, Christian, in the midst of your circumstances. These are the things that do not change. These are the things that anchor us. These are the things that make us love and serve our King. God is building. He's not stopped. God is building His kingdom. God is building His kingdom through His real King in Zion, not David, but Jesus. And God will build His kingdom through unworthy servants to the praise and glory of His name. I ask you today, are you in on this building all other buildings will topple all other kingdoms will be shattered this is the kingdom that remains forever and ever and yes we are treasured as we've heard through vbs and soon we're going to sing about it as we are led in two of the children's songs but in jesus we have been given the greatest treasure of all May God help us to pray and serve and serve and pray and pray and serve some more until the day when the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of our God and He will reign forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Um, Lord, we come to you today, sovereign over heaven and earth, the one who keeps the planets in orbit the one who in all of your versatility and variety has created each one of us so that no one of us is identical to the other. We bless you for the purposes and plans that you have for us. We are not where we are just as David was not where you put him simply by chance. David realized for all of his failings and sinfulness that you had made him king for a purpose, for the sake of the people. And Lord, you have made us your royal children, not for our own sake, but for your kingdom. And to spread your honor and glory through the world, wherever you have placed us. Help us to be true and faithful. Keep us fast. May we, in our day and age, see spiritual awakening and revival such as we've never seen before. Because you reign and you rule and your purposes prevail. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, something a little bit different. Uh, Martina, you are going to be leading us in two songs. And I think we will all stand. And uh, the children would know these songs as well. But we want the parents to know them just as well by the end of this. Yes, sir. The two cheerleaders, uh, can you join me a little bit, Phoebe and Nina? And you are here in the dry area, don't worry. And, okay, executive decision. God give us the treasure of a dry moment. So I'm calling all VBS children who know the songs uh, from last week. 
all help okay. us who feel in the groove to join them, but definitely we need a few VBS children up here to show your parents and all the other adults how to get in the VBS move and groove. Any children coming to join me up here? These okay. two songs are special desire from our pastor. And uh, so Ma Martina, just before, uh, I made a mistake. The sad reality is that if we stand, we can't see the children. So it's really <laughs> important we see the kids. So you just <laughs> sit down for a little while. Yeah. Okay. And children, join me here along in front of pastor and the flowers. Then your parents can see you really well.
priceless treasure God knows me, God hears me, God is my comfort I am His and there's nothing better Forgiven and chosen forever Go back. Yes. And the, the little treasures can go back to their seats. And I must say, uh, you know, I was uh, aware of the um, I was aware of the uh, the rhythm that we have in Africa. But Philippe Moulin, w where are you, Philippe, with your hat? I never knew that uh, Belgians could groove like that. So, <laughs> dear brother, thank you for dispelling my stereotypes. That's wonderful. We're going to stand and uh, sing together do doxology, then just uh, a few notices, uh, so uh, please stand uh, with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Yep. Oh. 